Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome back to Munch and Learn. Uh, my name is Elizabeth. I'm the Public Programs Coordinator here at the Dixon. I'll go over a few reminders and pieces of housekeeping uh, before we start. Um, we are going to be recording this session on Zoom, and you can find each week's talk published on the Dixon's YouTube channel, uh, just like it was before. Um, so if you ever want to revisit a talk, uh, you can just look there. Uh, if you have any questions for our speaker, we ask that you please hold them until the end, and then he'll answer your questions. Um, we also ask that you please either silence or turn off your cell phones uh, for the duration of the presentation. Um, our speaker today is Adam Queen, uh, one of the Dixon's own horticulturists, also a gardener and urban farmer. But first, I will turn the floor over to Dale, who's going to say a few words. Hey, everybody. It's great to be back in person uh, here, here for the Munch and Learn. So I know this is probably the third one or something that they've had, and maybe fourth one that they've had in person, but uh, it's good to, good to be back in person. I'm so tired of Zooming. I don't know how many of you feel the same way, but uh, I just wanted to say a couple of, of, of words about uh, Adam Queen. Um, we're thrilled to have Adam on the Dixon horticulture team here. Uh, he is uh, just a young person that is very, very enthusiastic about all things horticulture, all things growing. He has uh, completed uh, coursework at the, or with the Oregon State University uh, Dr. Elaine Ingham, she uh, uh, promotes the soil food web, which is about uh, uh, the microbes and all the living things and the living components of the soil, uh, fungi and mycorrhizae and all kinds of things that, that are uh, involved in the soil. And Adam has studied this extensively. And uh, he is currently uh, attending University of Memphis part-time and uh, pursuing a botany degree. Uh, where he's really geeking out on things like organic chemistry that he really loves and things like that. So anyway, it's just great to see someone young with this kind of enthusiasm, and we are thrilled to have him here at the Dixon. And uh, we're expecting many, many great things over the next few years from Adam. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn you over to Adam Queen. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Dale. And thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, today's topic is on just a basic introduction to no-dig gardening and kind of the feedback I've been getting from telling people about this is it's too good to be true and it kind of is and it kind of isn't. There are some nuances that I wanted to talk about and honestly I believe it's a good way for both gardeners and landscapers to help close the carbon loop because you know today we hear about carbon, carbon, carbon all over the news everywhere we go and I believe that we can play a role in helping with that situation. So what is no dig? This is a term that was honestly made popular by veggie growers in England. So it is more of a traditional row crop kind of a thing, but I think that it can be utilized in the landscape as well. Um, so, you know, like basically they call them, now they call them uh, market growers. They used to call them truck patch farmers. You know, they would go in, they have a plot of land, they would just till it up throughout the year and apply chemical fertilizers like ammonium nitrate for green plant growth and stuff like that. But this led to a lot of problems such as loss of organic matter, the compaction, poor soil structure, things just did not grow well in that situation. Um, so no dig uses the concept of a deep mulch and not disturbing the soil. So I think that's where people can get confused about no dig is that you just take a piece of ground plant your plant, you're done. It's, it's honestly a lot more to it than that. So it's also not a do nothing gardening approach, which if you're interested in reading uh, kind of an Eastern philosophy book, check out uh, Masanobu Fukuoka with uh, the One Straw Revolution. That kind of like shifted my perspective on gardening a little bit. So it's, it's really simple, it really is. I mean, have you ever placed a piece of cardboard or a leaf pile in your yard and walked away and forgot about it for a couple of months. That's basically the same thing. <laughs> so, you know, when you pick up that cardboard, you see all these worms, arthropods, um, just moving around. The soil is generally moist and there's got a lot of holes in it from all of these organisms going around in it. So in a sense, when you say no dig and no till, which we call it in America, it's the organisms that are doing the tillage for you. 
But when you run a rototiller through there or you chop it up, you know, spade it, whatever you want to do, um, it destroys their habitat, essentially. Then they have to rebuild and it takes time. Um, so this is achieved by bolstering both the micro and macro organisms, which break down this organic matter. And this is the one that's providing nutrients. Um, and another interesting point, in order to just not be like, well, you know, just dig a whole planet, throw some mulch on top. This would have been a five minute conversation. So <laughs> I decided to kind of see how organic gardeners on a small scale could help reduce waste to landfills. So we'll get into that in a second. One more slide why it's important though. Um, it's centered around the idea of biodiversity, both above and below the soil. Um, focuses on soil health. Uh, gardeners are helping to regenerate the ecology from the ground up. And I did look up a few studies to try to back up this information. And there was a study led by Roel von Klink, who's a biodiversity research ex expert. And I think it was in 2019. But they found that we're seeing a 10.5% decrease in terrestrial insects per decade. Um, and this is a peer reviewed study. There have been meta analysis studies on this as well to, to back that up. Um, and then another separate study, Kenneth V. Rosenberg found that we're, we've seen 3 billion birds decline since 1970. So with that in mind, you know, and later in the slide, I'll point out that the National Garden Survey of America says that 77% of American households are gardeners. So you might think that you might have a plot of land in the back that doesn't mean much, but 77% of American households, I mean, would, it really adds up if you think about it. So just a brief look at what this carbon cycle is without getting too technical. Carbon is essentially the building block of life. It's, it's in everything. It's the basic carbon chain that binds everything together. Um, it is the second most abundant atom in the human body, oxygen being the first. Um, according to the EPA, landfills are the third highest contributor of methane and carbon dioxide. That's important because just in a nutshell, the way that the greenhouse effect works is that these, this methane, this carbon dioxide gets released into the atmosphere. The sun comes in as photons, bounces off the earth, hits these carbon, these simple carbon chains, causes a vibration, the photon and energy is trapped in the carbon chain. So the more of these things that you have in the atmosphere, the higher vibration that you have, the hotter it gets. So enteric fermentation, which are basically cows, animals, livestock, humans, account for 27%. And petroleum uh, and natural gas systems accounted for 30%. Now, why this is important is because if you think about, you know, all of these leaves that we're putting on the curb and they're taking to the dump or Though that small amount of, and I'm not trying to chastise anybody, you know, we're just trying to do the best that we can. But if you think about utilizing these waste streams as mulches as opposed to garbage, it could change things a little bit for us. Um, in 2018, 21.59% um, of US municipal food waste was food. Now, I'll cover. Uh, that can get challenging in the city because if you try to do a hot compost pile with food scraps in the city, you will attract vermin. I know firsthand, now I'm dealing with it. <laughs> but there are systems out there that, that uh, utilize anaerobic fermentations with lactic acid bacteria in closed vessels that you later can bury in the garden. I've not had a problem with vermin since I've started doing that. Um, and also, um, yard waste accounted for 12.11%, and it actually tied with the plastic waste. So that's kind of a big deal, you know? Um, so how does nature handle this waste? So nature utilizes a team of microorganisms to break down organic matter, making nutrients available to plants. You know, in our bodies, we have carbon, we have nitrogen, phosphorus, calcium, we have all of these plant available nutrients. Even if I were to lay down and die, I would break down and become fertilizer, essentially. Um, so that's how you have the fungi, the nematodes, you have this whole array of this soil food web that's just like, just breaking down this larger scale organic matter. And once it breaks down, the free floating cations and anions are available for plants to uptake. So this is in place of what you may have seen with uh, synthetic fertilizers. You know, you can have a piece of ground, you can plant your plants, throw your osmocodone, 
it's it's quick it's it's uh, easy it's done this takes a little bit more time but it does work and i've seen it work and i've got pictures um from this previous year's experiment to prove that honestly it's kind of amazing um but without this process the soil becomes compacted leading to decreased water infiltration decreased oxygen permeability and inevitably disease because you're creating very unhealthy plants and uh, you know with the, the pandemic and everything we've kind of had to take a step back and realize that you know health is the most important thing what can we do for our own bodies that can help us be more disease resistant essentially um again when you disturb the soil it destroys its habitat so by doing this no dig non-soil disturbance with deep mulching you're just constantly adding organic matter on top of the ground year after year sometimes multiple times a year and you're just constantly building that ecosystem Okay, so no dig gardening, and there's this new term that's floating around. You may have heard of regenerative farming, which is basically um, taking a piece of land and leaving you better, leaving it better than you found it, building these soil food web organisms. Well, now there's a huge interest in horticulture globally because it's it's taken off in England too, um, and it's called eco ecological horticulture. Sorry. But yeah, it's the same principle. It's, it's keeping the health of the soil and the planet and your neighbors in mind when you're doing these types of things. It's, it's realizing that I don't have to spray for my aphid problem if I have a healthy um, uh, ladybug larva coming behind it. But if you sprayed ladybug larva, would you have a healthy population of ladybug larva come because it never saw that spike in aphids? Um, but like I said, this no dig is most definitely a veggie gardener thing, but I do see ways that this can be utilized in a urban landscape as well. Um, Cause we're basically already doing it. We, you know, we're not going in with rototillers. I mean, it doesn't matter if you have a square bed, a round bed, a triangle bed, whatever kind of shapes you wanna make in the earth, you're, you're still doing the same things. It's still a bed. So if you till it, if you chop it, if you spade it, because there was this one popular thing made by John Jevons in the late 70s, early 80s, called uh, no, not no dig, it was called a uh, double dig, double dig gardening, where you would take a bed, you would dig out the first six to 10 inches, place it in a wheelbarrow, then dig down further into the clay layer and set that aside, put the wheelbarrow back in the bed, and then put the clay layer on top of that. It, it's just a lot of work. It's like, why would you do that when you can just layer organic matter on top of the soil instead of like going through all this trouble of digging? So it's definitely a, a way of thinking, you know, how can I make this better for everyone around me, for myself? How can we become healthier kind of a situation? Um, but the key difference in this system is the recycling of organic matter on your own property, being able to think of ways that, okay, I don't need to go to Lowe's to buy peat moss, I could pile up leaves in a nice column that looks appeasing to my neighbors and make leaf mold for the next year. It's leaf mold is great stuff. We have about a hundred tons of it if we can get rid of it, but it's, it really is. And um, yeah, there's one talk too, like you might say, oh, this guy's crazy. He's telling me to let my garden go wild. But I mean, not really. You can still keep your high traffic areas like right in front of your house, keep them clean kind of stuff, but the hedges and stuff on the outside of your high traffic areas, areas you could let them become a little bit more wild. So by creating this deep mulch layer, it's really creating a duff layer. I mean, have you ever gone into the forest and scraped away the leaves, the sticks, the branches, got down to that very top layer of soil where you see all these organisms and just smell it? It smells rich, it smells foresty. We even have dubbed a name for it that, call it that says it's humus. So this is essentially what we're trying to create and I've seen very good success in my own garden by doing this. It definitely looks, it doesn't look terrible, but it doesn't look like what we're used to for sure. <laughs> but so, okay. So by practicing no, get, no dig, we are creating a vital layer that is necessary for not only soil health, but local ecology. Um, 
This layer protects soil from harsh rains, which results in compaction. And it also insulates the soil, which actually gives you a little bit of a jump start on next growing season because it's a little bit warmer than if you just left the soil completely bare. Um, this also provides a habitat for insects who use it for hibernation over the winter, si winter time. So we talked about that 10% that per decade decline in insects in the United States. This is a way for local gardeners to try to help with that situation. Um, and you know, in nature, this is what happens. Twigs, leaves, branches, fruits, they all fall to the ground. No one goes into the forest and picks them up. Yet next year, vegetation shoots from beneath them and the process starts all over again. Okay, so gardeners small but mighty. Everyone can contribute to make the world a better place. As gardeners, I mean, I believe we inherently want to make the earth around us a better place. We see a plot of land, we want to make it look better. We wanna help support the bird population, the insect population. Um, by taking this concept, you really are doing your part by closing the carbon loop. Because instead of placing the leaves on the curb, instead of placing the branches, which can be chipped with an electric chipper, um, you know, the yard waste could be something like your salvias that you had to cut back or your, uh, um, your tall grasses, your ornamental grasses and stuff. This could be, there's a term called chop and drop. I don't know if you've heard of that, but essentially like you just chop the plant and put it back on top of the ground and use it as mulch. That might not be appealing to some, but if you wanted to dress it up, you could put something like pine bark mulch over the top of it too and help cover that up. But you're creating that duff layer that's fluffy, thick, um, that insects can live in. Um, and by doing this heavy mulching, you can keep these nutrients on your property and out of the landfill. So, I mean, you, I think there's this huge transition and this is a good answer for the city gardeners because it kind of bypasses what we're used to as hot composting. And that takes a lot of effort. I've done it before. You have to store all of everything and make your pile at once. And it's honestly a headache for a backyard gardener. You know, if you have five, 10 acres out in the country, you could very easily do it. Just pile them up as tall as the house and come back to them next year. But you can't really do that here. <laughs> okay, so... I want to kind of cover like starting a no dig bed. And first rule is just keep it simple. The whole thing to this essentially is identifying like basically what you want to grow, what makes you happy, and two, what waste streams do you have available to you that you could divert from the landfills. Um, what I found works pretty well is if you have a grassy area, there's kind of a lot of ways you can go about it, but the simplest one would be to basically cut the grass down really, really low. Um, if you have some really tall transplants that you want to put in, like trees or shrubs or bushes or something, you could put down cardboard and then mulch over the top of that. But it's a lot of mulch. It's like four to six inches thick at least. And I would not recommend using wood chips as a mulch for that system because it could actually pull nitrogen to break down the wood chips. Plus a lot of things will grow through them as well. I've had pretty good success with um, letting part of my garden go wild. And I think I'll talk about this a little bit later, but uh, cutting it with a scythe and basically making hay and using that as a thick mulch layer. And that works really well. Um, you know, they, they say it takes a, a new garden a year to, to see what it's gonna do. And that's very, very true. So the first year you try it, things might be slow, but after that second, third, especially the third year I've noticed, once that third year hits, it's just like overabundance. So by continuously applying mulch and compost, you're continuously feeding the soil and uh, making use of your waste that you're generating on your property as well. Um, and you know, you couldn't, this is kind of playing off the idea of a raised bed, traditionally what you could do is take, you know, a four by eight square, two by fours, two by sixes, two by eights, however deep you want to go, put the cardboard down and then put compost over the top of that. It's kind of the same thing, but it can be expensive if you're buying compost that way. And it's just, it makes more sense to save more money. You know, if you're pulling stuff off your own property, you're not contributing to the carbon load that it took to truck it there. 
even if you go to the big box stores to buy it, you know, they pull those things in 18 wheelers. So it just kind of, at this point with our carbon problem, we, it just kind of makes sense. So this is my garden on June 1st of this year. Um, it's a quarter acre off Southern Avenue. I did not till it. I did not apply fertilizer. I didn't do anything. Well, I did plant into it. That's what I did. Um, this, what's, what's the button? There it is. This space over here was just grass and a cover crop, probably about waist high. Um, I just cut it down and planted tomatoes into it. Um, and this space over here, I didn't really even do much to it, but this is my wild space back here where I was talking about like that stuff probably got up over waist high and I cut it with a scythe and used it as mulch. And then uh, 30 days later, this was it. Um, public service announcement, you might see some hemp plants. The state of Tennessee said I could do that. <laughs> so um, yeah, so these are the tomatoes now and you couldn't even see them before. And all I did was just mulch them with living mulch, probably about six inches thick once. Um, there were some grass issues and I think I'll come to that later. Um, but it was easily taken care of just by mulching over the top. So on the topic of direct seeding versus transplanting, um, transplanting obviously works best. I have had good success with seeding, but sown very thickly. Like I planted a row of buckwheat, which is right there. And if you saw it before, it was like bachelor's button, some random weeds and such. I pulled all that out and just seeded buckwheat really thick. That's the only way I've seen direct seeding work in the system. If you do, um, you probably could do sunflowers or beans or some other sort of larger seed with a plant that has some real vigor when it comes up. Um, you know, bulbs, tubers, rhizomes, divisions, um, those work really well because you kind of already have a plant right there. But seeding, you know, if you plant like one, like carrots, Ami uh, would not do well in this kind of situation. You would need a transplant before you do that. Um, yeah, so when you're transplanting, it gives you a bigger plant. You see a better target for what you're wanting to grow. And that's kind of the way that I look at it. I've almost kind of wondered if I should dub this smother tech because you're really smothering the weeds. So instead of going out traditionally and pulling the weeds by hand, hoeing them down, you're really just Put, you can push them down, but then once you put that six inches of mulch on top of them, they can't grow through it. But if you already have a plant that has a 12 inch head start over a one to two inch weed, it very easily outcompetes and takes off after the mulch layer is put in. Um, yeah, if you wanted to direct seed, you could pull back an area of mulch, like maybe like a small area, but again, you have to be kind of vigilant. You can't just throw that seed out and walk away um, it will grow. It might not look like you want it to, but again, definitely the weed competition. It, it kind of depends on the plant too. Um, so another big area I've seen with growing in the city is compaction. Um, this is a broad fork. Uh, it has 14 inch tines. I've used this extensively in my garden because before the pictures you saw there in 2019, that was entirely bamboo. It was literally a bamboo forest. So I had somebody come in, cut the bamboo stalks down and remove probably 30 cubic yards of ry bamboo rhizomes. There's some, everybody thought I was crazy, but there is some still bamboo that comes up, but it's not nearly as bad as it was. And it provided an opportunity because the soil was compacted, it was poor, it was clay. And now it's a thriving ecosystem by doing this no dig, by doing this deep mulch technology kind of a thing. So, it's, it's pretty easy to tell if you have compaction because especially in grass, crabgrass really loves to grow in compaction, quack grass. Um, you can walk out on your yard. If it doesn't feel spongy, you probably got compaction. So you can also take a, uh, a steel rod. Sometimes I'll take my knife and just stick it down on the ground if it goes down on the ground easy. Um, compaction is not really an issue, but what you could do is get like a, two foot steel rod. And if you once you can push down the ground easy, that first layer that you hit, that's 
that stops it, that's the compaction layer. So, you know, if it's only four inches down, you probably want to use something like this because it's going to, um, it doesn't invert the soil and it, it goes down 14 inches and breaks it up. Um, I've also had really good success with, if I have compaction like this, utilizing this tool and putting either a compost tea or a uh, fermented fertilizer because it's able to get down in the ground faster. You can do this, and I know this is kind of like, well, you're saying dig now. It's like, yes and no. That's why I was like, there are some nuances to this. You could eventually have good soil if you did this on compacted ground, but it's going to take longer. This expedites the process. I found that you really only have to do this once. And then after that, you just continue on with the heavy mulching and no more soil disturbance is needed after that. Um, yeah, I think I covered all the areas on that. But this is a huge problem. Compaction is, this is where everybody gets confused because they'll, they'll want to go out, dig a hole, throw some mulch down, but they didn't address the compaction. And the deeper that your roots can go, the more nutrients they can get to, the more water that they can get to, the deeper the, the duff layer becomes, the more microbes you can house in your, uh, I think it's called a troposphere. Definitely the O horizon, like your soil has different horizons, but we can get into that later. So types of mulch, um, I've used homemade compost, I've used leaves, I've used overgrown weeds, lawn trimmings, fresh straw and hay, um, wood chips. Uh, but like I said, the wood chips, I would use sparingly. One, they don't really have good weed control. And two, they can rob nitrogen from the soil. I've had really good success with um, overgrown weeds. That's what this is right here. Um, that was from what I call my back 40 because I don't go back there that much. And um, yeah, that's just fresh and just, just placed over the top and let it rot and do its thing. Um, leaves work really well, but they take longer to break down. If you're gonna do a leaf mold pile, it takes at least a year. It actually gets better with two to three years, but I've had pretty good success with um, using leaves as a uh, pathway in the garden, like um, in between your beds or something. Because the way I have my garden set up, it's more like a, like a truck patch. So it's like a 30 inch walkway with a, you know, a 12 inch walkway with a 30 inch bed and you just do that however many times you have land. And so it creates these, these trenches. And what I've been doing with these trenches is actually composting in place. I'll fill them full of wood chips and then I don't have to weed the trenches. And then later in the year, I can go back, scoop that up, put it on top of the bed. And I've just, you know, decreased the waste stream and also, um, created mulch for myself right next to where it's gonna go. And the worms love it too. What I've noticed instead of creating an isolated bed like this, because this would be a bed, those are some peppers and eggplant over there, that's another bed. And I've noticed that if you don't have something here, it isolates. So now that you have a deep mulch here of wood chips, you're creating another duff layer and increasing uh, microbial diversity in the process. Um, so yeah, the principle behind all of this is layers in place of tillage. So, and I've, I've done the, the old school truck patch thing where you have a tiller and your pathways are as wide as your tiller. You go down through there and, and weed them out. This is so much easier. Um, and it keeps your property looking nice because, you know, you have to be able to, to trim and prune and all of those things. So this is a side-by-side -side comparison. This is... Uh, two rows of tomatoes in my tomato patch this year. Uh, the weeds did get out of control. This was probably middle of July. Um, as you can see over here, the grass got really tall. Um, and all I did was I did, I went through there, did a light pull through it on top of the ground. And I had some basically two week old uh, grass clippings like um, that was essentially turning into wet straw. And I threw that on top of the, uh, the weeds that I pulled and that lasted for another month. And this is kind of that, yeah, right there. So you can see that there's the tomatoes after the grass is gone, the, the grass was thrown on the ground and you know leaves, straw, debris, 
all sorts of things in there. And I found I really didn't have to water as much too, which was kind of awesome because it cut down on my water usage. So the weeds in no dig, there's not a lot of weeds. The only caveat I would see this time of year, I did not mulch that plot on the left side of my garden that we saw earlier. And I am seeing a lot of chickweed and stuff like that. And that stuff can get out of control very quickly. And I'm planting things like really close together like onions, beets, and they're not growing that much this time of year. And that's kind of hard to mulch around. So you kind of have to take into consideration like what you're planting, like wider spacing works a lot better in the system, bigger plants that grow faster kind of a thing. And honestly, with perennials, the beauty of the system is like perennials don't need a lot of nutrients anyway. So you're able to cut back your synthetic fertilizers. I've cut them back to a third. And this next year, I'm thinking about like not doing it at all. Um, but also too, I'll go over the fertilizer experiments I've been using with um, making fermented liquid fertilizers. I've been having really good success with those. Um, but like I said earlier, you know, if weeds do become an issue, you can just basically just bury them and just keep adding to that mulch layer. Um, and without the tillage or disturbance, weed seeds remain dormant in the soil because whenever you go to chop, whenever you go to uh, dig in your garden, you actually uh, will pull up dormant weed seeds that are two inches below the soil surface. They can re-germinate. So if you're constantly adding mulch to the top, you're, you're just pushing them down further essentially. Um, and it's a mindset shift. It's, it's instead of pulling weeds and saying weeds are the bad guy, it's kind of understanding that those weeds have nitrogen atoms in them. They have phosphorus atoms. They have vital nutrients that can be used for your garden instead of making methane at the landfill. So this was an interesting aha moment for me because this was like the poorest area of my garden in the middle. Um, one year ago, this time last year, it was literally a pond, it would hold water. And now it's, it's after a year of doing this no tillage and it's just heavy clay too, compaction's horrible. Even if you go dig it now, it looks like clay, it's wet, it's moist, but there's worms starting to move through it to create it, to make it more porous. So what I did with this was, um, during the pandemic, I bought a scythe and they were probably the best purchase I've ever made, even though it sounds like a lot of work, it's, it's kind of enjoyable. So this area back here was just probably, you know, looked like blight, honestly. It was just tall grass, lots of weeds and stuff. Cut it all down with the scythe and moved it here. Didn't disturb the soil or anything, just put it around the plants and that stuff, that it really works. It, it took off, it was, it was kind of amazing. I saw an increase in worm population in that area. Um, micro arthropods, but they're essentially like uh, roly polies and stuff like that. I saw more of those. Um, I'd never watered this area at all and it retained moisture and did just fine. Um, I think I got some pumpkins in here. I did plant a lot of hemp there and it did very well in that area. I was kind of seeing if hemp could be used as a uh, cover crop and it definitely can. Um, let's see. Yeah, so you can compost this, you can, there's, there's lots of things because instead of cutting this, taking it to the curb, letting the city of Memphis deal with it, I put it back in my garden and it was kind of amazing the results. Um, and this is the area uh, today. So this is another cover crop um, of oats, peas. I think I was with Dale when I bought it. He made fun of me because I was buying it. It was a big buck, uh, something or another from Tractor Supply. <laughs> it was like a, but it works. It's oats, it's peas, radish, all those types of stuff. Um, and an interesting thing to note with this trial that I did was I planted wheat back here. I tilled it in lightly because I didn't have enough mulch. I ran out of mulch. So in order to get that good seed to soil contact, I tilled it in, rain came and germinated just fine. Um, when the previous, uh, I guess you would call it a crop, I'm not really selling it, but um, crop was out, this one, 
I just threw the seed on top of the ground and didn't do anything and walked away. And this is what happened. So my plan for this now is to let this go till probably March. No, I think I'm gonna do tomatoes here next year. I haven't decided yet. But to let it get tall, essentially, cut it down, drop it, plant into it, put more mulch on top. It's that easy. So a little bit worried about making your own fertilizers. If you have too much debris that you don't know what to do with, I found that this method works really well. It's called the Johnson Sioux Bioreactor. And essentially it is a, inside this uh, shade cloth is a, um, is a wire ring. You, know, you can make it as big as you want, but it, it kind of looks nicer. I mean, you could even go a step above and tuck it in even nicer and make some harder lines and stuff. But essentially you just pile it up in there and let it sit. The trick to this though, is to use a high carbon material. You wouldn't want to use like fresh grass. You kind of like want to let it lay out for a bit. This is a really good system for your leaves. Um, uh, wood chips, you can mix in wood chips with it. Um, other woody garden debris can also be mixed in here. Um, another trick that I found works really well is if you put a, uh, make a smaller tube to go in the center. So that way it's, it's aerated completely around. So they say that air can only travel in a pile like this up to three inches. So it's getting air from the outside. It's also getting air from that tube in the center to, to get the middle. And if you're using more higher carbon ratio materials, it's gonna have more aeration naturally anyway. If you were to fill this thing full of wet grass, you're gonna have an anaerobic situation, which you could use later, but just know that it stinks and it's messy. So you might not wanna do that. <laughs> so, but yeah, let it sit for a year. Again, I do not recommend food scraps in the city because now I have a vermin problem that I'm dealing with. And it's kind of funny. I did notice that this picture is a picture of the tiller in it and I'm talking about no tilling, but the whole reason this experiment got started this year was because I was using this in the early spring and it just started blowing motor out of the oil and I never fixed it. So I just, you know, was back against the wall to figure out how to make it work and it completely exceeded my expectations. Um, all right, so I kind of left this one and the Bokashi for the last bits of the talk because this is the part where it kind of gets a little crazy according to our Western standards, but I've used it. I've found that it works really well. It's very easy. Um, so anaerobic ferments are essentially what they sound like. You can take, it works best with uh, bioaccumulating plants like comfrey, nettle. Um, I've even found pokeweed which is poisonous to certain levels. You know, it's like one of those plants that you have to know how to cook. So you essentially wash out the alkaloids that could poison you. Um, I wouldn't try it unless you're feeling daring, but definitely this works because you basically, you're, you're taking advantage of that waste stream. You got some extra stuff, you know, you're at that last bit, you mulched all that you can mulch. You don't know what else to do with this last bit. You just don't want to pile it up around the house. I've, put them in five gallon buckets, I put them in 30 gallon containers, I put them in trash cans. Um, and you essentially just fill it full of your green material, get a handful of really rich soil, um, either from a forest setting or a very productive area of your garden that's more fungally dominated. Um, top it off with water, let it sit for a year. You can stir it occasionally, but I do warn you, this stuff stinks the first six months. <laughs> so. After six months, I've found that the smell starts to level out. And after a year, it doesn't have a smell anymore, which is kind of amazing. Um, you're going to want to want to dilute this anywhere from one to 100 to one to 500. That means I typically will put maybe 100 milliliters per watering can, something like that. And that, air, that, that can be played with. It kind of depends on like where you're at in the season, how much of this stuff that you have stocked up. If you have a lot of it, go ahead and use one to 100. If you're kind of running low, you could even use one to a thousand. So yeah, like I said, the bioaccumulators work like comfrey, nettle, uh, pokeweed, stuff like that. Like, you know, the plants that just do good in our area without even nobody trying. <laughs> Weeds, essentially. 
Um, so I found that this is a good alternative for your veggie scraps, your kitchen scraps. Um, this is known as Bokashi composting and it's, it's pretty popular and it's catching on more. Um, like I said, if you were out in the country, you could pile this stuff up tall as the house. You don't have neighbors for 20 miles, nobody cares. But in the city, it does attract vermin when you throw food out the door. So this is a anaerobic, it's actually a facultative anaerobe, which means that the bacteria thrives in both oxygen rich and non-oxygen rich conditions. And that bacteria is actually really good for compaction because it can get down in the soil and it can be happy in lower areas of the soil where oxygen might be depleted. So it kind of helps break that up a little bit. Um, but yeah, it's a lactobacillus fermentation. Um, you can either use uh, EM1 or uh, you can make this stuff at home. If you're not a DIY person, all of this stuff is readily available online. Uh, this is what's known as Bokashi grain, and that's been inoculated with the lactobacillus bacteria. So essentially what you do is um, put your veggie scraps in, compact them down, sprinkle this stuff on top, and you keep doing that until it's full. Once it's full, um, you bury it in your garden. Again, no dig talk. Why are we digging in the garden? It's a way to get rid of waste that otherwise would go to the landfill. It's kind of like a worse of, it's not really worse of two evils because you are giving back. Um, this does produce a leachate that drains from the bottom. This can be stored and used as a fertilizer. It works really well. It does have a smell to it. Um, and it needs to be used at about one to 100, one to 500. I would not put this leachate in a sealed container because it will blow up. I've done it. <laughs> it was disgusting. <laughs> okay, so in conclusion, I don't know how we're doing on time, but if you guys have questions. Um, yeah, so it's the simplicity of this gardening style is what makes it for me. And also the, um, just the success I had over this past year, I did not expect it to work that well. I mean, you couldn't hardly walk through my garden and Dale can attest to that. He went out there and had a poke around and it was, I couldn't get a wheelbarrow through there anymore. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, it's, it's all about, you know, it's all about paying it forward kind of a mindset. It's, it's an idea of not taking from your soil, but it's an idea of, of giving back and it's in a almost think, no, it is, it's, it's thinking forward in the sense of how can I not contribute to a larger problem at the landfill and utilize these resources in my garden as mulches and build soil structure that way. Um, yeah, like we said before, the 77% uh, of American households are gardeners. So really the whole idea of this lecture that I, just kept mulling through my head and I hope you picked up on is how how can we utilize these um, waste streams and as gardeners even though there's not many of us but in numbers we are large and our plots of land aren't 2,000 acres 20,000 100,000 acres we're not sequestering that much carbon but you know if you uh, if every gardener did their little bit in the city you could decrease the uh, the landfills a little bit. So, yeah, I think that's my time. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Yes. Are you able to do leaves? We're we're getting there. Our our black gold right now is our leaves. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> we do have a leaf compost that we're working on. And it's over a year old now, and we're going to plant tulips in the woodland gardens this year. Basically, just kind of like set them in place, nestle them into the soil a little bit, and then throw the leaf mold back over the top and utilize the compost that way. Yeah. Yes. Imagine that you had a huge field that was a compost pile where they were actually put all out. I mean, I know you have to deal with the wind and all, and I suppose that would be an issue. But would something like that work if we had places in the city where we could actually dump our leaves? 
It would. Um, the city of Memphis is not as progressive as the other cities in the country. Like um, I know in Portland, Oregon, you can pull up to the dump, pay less than 20 bucks and get a truck full of compost, um, which is roughly about a yard. Um, Memphis, we have, we do have Atlas Organics, which you can pay for. Um, but as far as the leaves go, I know they collect them. There is leaf mold that's being processed in the city, but you can't buy it and you, you can't be a, a, a resident to get it. You have to be like a nonprofit or a neighborhood association. Um, it's probably gonna have a lot of plastic in it, but it's, you know, le lesser of two evil situations. It's better to use it than let it sit there, go to the landfill. So yeah, definitely. Yeah, um, I just recently found it. I've been searching for it. I haven't contacted them. I think it takes them like two weeks to get back to you. Um, but I think it's through the city of Memphis or Make Memphis Beautiful website or something like that. Yeah. Yes. You talk about rats, but you compost with uh, clippings from Bermuda. Hmm. Bermuda can be. Yeah, I try to eliminate that one. When I have Bermuda, I essentially just try to smother it with cardboard. <laughs> and even still, yeah, it, you can do a hot compost, but that's that's a lot of work. And it's not 100% that you're going to get all of it anyway. Um, I have found, yeah, I'm working on that one. I haven't really found a good resource for that one yet. If you find one, let me know. <laughs> Oh yeah. That cotton gin. Ah yes, I would be careful with that because of the amount of spray that they put on those plants. Especially, uh, it might be okay within. There's just not a lot of research on how long the, the half life is on those compounds. Oh, okay. Yeah, I would be, yeah, I would try that on a small area of my garden if I was going to do that first, because I have heard of people getting compost, um, like small farms in Middle Tennessee, and it completely ruined their whole operation. So it can be touchy. I have had even like horse manure. I've had an experience with horse manure where they sprayed a 2,4-D for the hay, and it can actually survive the gut of the horse, and it looks like somebody sprayed 2,4-D on your tomatoes, they curl kind of a thing, and it'll live in the soil for like five to 10 years. And the only way to get rid of it is just to keep tilling it, which sounds horrible. <laughs> but yeah, I would just be careful. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Well, if, if I'm just a four mill harvest, I'm not growing veggies. Um, how would you see? I mean, typically, what you, know, you don't till after you plant anyway. Right. What, what lessons would you take home from that for people who maybe already have stuff established or are planning on establishing who want to build that? I would, I could see that's where it got confusing because it was this is more of like a veggie kind of focused topic. But yeah, I think it can be translated to ornamental beds by using utilizing deep mulch, a diversity of mulches kind of a thing even like the chop and drop method in early spring. Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, talk around leaving foliage higher for longer because it actually can host beneficial insects through the winter time. So they're talking about like, you know, leaving the, the ornamentals before you cut them before they have that spring growth again for a little bit longer. Um, and if you do cut them to leave, uh, a foot or so, which again looks unsightly, but it it does benefit the ecosystem. So I think, yeah, long quit, long answer short. <laughs> I think that uh, definitely like deep mulching, which is, I mean, I feel like when I was looking at this, I feel like that the the ornamental landscaping people were already doing this kind of a thing. So it's just a matter of utilizing what waste streams you already have available to you.
All right, thank you very much, Adam. Uh, we appreciated learning about this. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so uh, thank you everyone for attending. Uh, next week's Lunch and Learn will be on Horace Pippin uh, with our curator, Julie. Um, the week after, December 29th, the last Lunch and Learn of the year will be virtual. Um, you can register and get your link for that uh, starting now. Um, if you aren't currently a Dixon member, we invite you to renew or join. We'd be grateful to add your name to the list of members who help make the Dixon the special place it is. And we invite you to come to the Dixon and see Black Artists in America from the Great Depression to Civil Rights and the Mallory Wurzberger exhibition by Philip R. Dodson. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Drive safe if you're leaving us tonight.